Welcome everybody to our little Bible study. Today we will be covering Philippians chapter 1 and um, we're so happy you could join us. Um, please um, join me in a small prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that it is only because of your son Jesus Christ that we can come before your holy presence. And we thank you for um, your word in the King James Bible. We thank you for our Apostle Paul. We thank you for helping us to understand the mystery. And we pray, Lord, that we can help all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery that you have revealed to us in your precious word. And we ask you to give us all spiritual understanding and those who are watching us and joining us by YouTube and Facebook. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Okay, so um, Philippians chapter 1, Christ is our life. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Uh, verses 1 through 11, the fellowship of the gospel. 12 through 24, Paul had a single mind, for the furtherance of the gospel. 25 through 30, your furtherance and joy of faith of the gospel. Reproof is correction. Um, well, I mean, reproof, what is the difference between reproof and correction? I'll just tell you. Reproof <laughs> has to do with our conduct, oh, what it's right we're there. doing, okay? <laughs> and correction has to do with our thinking how we should think. So the letters to the Philippians is a mild reproof of the Philippians for not living up to the doctrine in Ephesians concerning the unity of the body of Christ. So in the process of our verse to verse, verse by verse expository teaching today, we will um, not only be covering but, uh, chapter 1, but we will answer some questions. What is the day of Jesus Christ? What is hyper-dispensationalism? Why is it important to be both biblically and dispensationally correct? And what is the mystery of godliness mentioned in 1 Timothy 3.16? So, Christ is mentioned 18 times in chapter 1, and um, the word gospel uh, six times. So he says, your fellowship in the gospel, in verse 5. The defense and confirmation of the gospel, in verse 7. Furtherance of the gospel, in verse 12. The defense of the gospel, in verse 17. As it becometh the gospel in 127 and the faith of the gospel also in 127. So the gospel is not just how to be saved. It is the entire 13 letters that Paul wrote, Romans to Philemon. It's all that sound doctrine for the body of Christ. And I want to just say that um, Christ revealed this information to Paul progressively. So he didn't give Paul all the information at once. So, um, let's see. Um, do you remember that we um, talked about our edification process? And the red ring here represents Ephesians. We finished that. And if you haven't heard the whole um, Ephesians um, Bible study of the six chapters, you can find it on YouTube by putting in Marianne Manley. Or going to Aaron Grace. Uh, well, actually, he's, um, he lost his YouTube channel, so now it's called Aaron G. So if you put Aaron G, you know, in a dot after the G, you can find his new channel and subscribe. So we are now in the green ring, which is Philippians. Later we'll do the yellow, which is Colossians, and the orange, which is Philippians. So um, the edification process is um, the 13 letters that are in, um, you know, that Paul wrote to the body of Christ. 
It is an edifice. An edifice is a house or a building, and we can picture this edifice of sound doctrine as a two-story building. So in this two-story building, Romans is the foundational doctrine, then 2 Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians are make up the walls. Then to go on to Ephesians is on the second level and is the further and more advanced doctrine. So we are now um, in that more advanced doctrine and the walls are Philippians and Colossians. Then um, First and Second Thessalonians put the roof on the building. Both of those um, have to do with um, the coming of Christ at the rapture and his second coming. Then First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are how to live in the house. So see how all that works together mm -hmm. and this picture of the edification process is in my new book that I will show you in a little bit but first let's talk about a little more on the Philippians so in chapter 1 Christ is our life for me to live is Christ and to die is gain is the, is the key verse then in chapter 2 Christ is our mind let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, will be the key verse. Then in chapter 3, Christ is our goal, that I may know him, is the key verse. Chapter 4, Christ is our strength. I can do all things through Christ, uh, who str which strengtheneth me. And then our chapter review sentence for chapter 1 will be the single mind. For chapter 2, the submissive or servant mind. For chapter 3, the spiritual mind. And chapter 4, the secure mind. So, we're going to be talking a lot in this chapter about our mind. So, what is hyperdispensationalism? Hyperdispen okay, first of all, let me tell you what a subdispensationalist or a hypo dispensationalist is. That is someone that says that the body of Christ began in Acts 2 and wrongly divide the Word of God. Someone that says that the body of Christ began in Acts 9 says that the body of Christ um, uh, at, uh, in Acts 9 with Paul's salvation divides the Bible where God divides it. And they are dispensationally correct. They are dispensational not hyper or hypo. So what is hypo? Hyper. Someone that says that the body of Christ began after Acts 9, such as in Acts 28, is a hyper dispensationalist, also known as an ultra dispensationalist. So it is essential to know when the body of Christ began. God has two groups of believers, one to live in the heavenly places, and another to live on the kingdom on earth. Um, why is it important to be both biblically and dispensationally correct? Because if you're not, you might believe the wrong gospel and not be saved. Mm -hmm. There are more than one gospel in the Bible, and we're going to talk about what our gospel is today. Okay, so... Someone that is not correctly, dis, you know, dividing the Word of God may think they're saved and not really be saved. But once you're saved, you're going to be secure. Okay, so today I just want to point out a few things on the map. Um, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and put in prison for two years in Caesarea. Then he was taken to Rome and spent another two years in prison. So he spent a total of four years in prison um, for a crime he did not commit. He was innocent. 
And we're going to, yes, go ahead, Mark. What was the crime he was accused of? He was accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple at Jerusalem. And he didn't. Mm -hmm. And so he was wrongly accused. So by the time we pick up our story for the Philippian letter, he will have been in prison for four years illegally and wrongly accused. Okay, so just to go over our chart here very briefly, um, Paul was saved in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. And God postponed his kingdom on earth uh, program. Mm -hmm. So Paul is not preaching Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He is not preaching Christ's earthly ministry. He is preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that Christ is revealing to him from heaven. That is where God divides the word of truth. Because all the Bible is truth. But we're told in 2 Timothy 2.15 to rightly divide, rightly dividing the word of truth. So to rightly divide the word of truth is to divide it where God divides it. So this yellow part that began with Paul's salvation on the road to Damascus in Acts 9 and will end at the rapture, all of the people that are saved between these two appearings of Jesus Christ, his appearing to Paul and his appearing to rapture the body of Christ, all of those people will live in the heavenly places. Okay? And all of the rest of the people in the white will live on the earth in the earthly kingdom. You see how easy that is? That's rightly dividing. Now I want to tell you what I believe the day of Jesus Christ is. I believe, and we're going to go over this a little bit more, that the day of Jesus Christ is composed of three different events. So, just listen to me for a minute. Don't write so much. Because we're going to go over this and you'll have the notes. Okay? And I will post the notes on uh, God's Secret Facebook page. So, the day of Christ is composed of the rapture and of the judgment seat of Christ where we'll have anything that was not done with Christ working through us, in us and through us, um, by his doctrine that he gave through Paul, will be burnt off. Then the third event that is included in the day of Christ is when Christ presents us to the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, remember that the day of Christ is composed of three events. And we're going to be going over that, so don't worry if you didn't get it all. Okay, I think... Um, I want to read to you a little bit about Paul's, um, um, okay, the, um, so what happened was that um, Paul sent the letter to the Philippians in appreciation for a gift they sent to him through Epaphroditus. The church at Philippi in Macedonia, a Roman colony, okay, let's look at that on the map. Uh, sure I pull out the right map. Uh-oh, where's the map I had? There it is. Okay. All right. So Macedonia is here, and Philippi is right there in the yellow part. Okay. So that's in, um, Philippi is a Roman colony in Macedonia. Um, and it was the first church that Paul planted in Europe on his second apostolic journey. And we're going to go over that. They had mutual love and respect for each other, Paul and the Philippians. However, Epaphroditus had informed Paul that the saints there were discouraged by his imprisonment 
and terrified by the persecution they were experiencing from their adversaries. He mentioned that two women were bickering and that the main bishop in Philippi was not helping the women and the little flock believers who had labored together with Paul in his ministry. Paul was innocent of the crime he was accused of. He had been illegally held in prison for a total of four years. The first two years in Caesarea and now two years in Rome. The Jews had accused him of bringing Gentiles into the temple at Jerusalem as it's talked about in Acts 21, 28 and 26, 31. But Paul had not done so. Paul was illegally being held in prison, but he did not complain. Why was Paul in prison? Because he was Satan's most hated man. Souls were being saved and lives were being changed because Paul was preaching the true gospel of salvation. How that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. People could now be forgiven of their sins and justified before God by faith in Jesus Christ, something trying to keep the law of Moses could not do, as Paul said in Acts 13, 38 and 39. Satan thought he could stop Paul. As soon as Satan figured out that God was now working through Paul, he left off persecuting Peter and the little Jewish believing remnant in Jerusalem and directed all his forces to hunting down Paul. In Act 29, the Grecian Jews in Jerusalem went about to slay Paul. His friends, composed mainly of believers in Israel's program, sent him to Tarsus in Acts 9.30. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and were multiplied. That's in Acts 9.31. So then the Jewish kingdom church had rest and saints were added to that church, the kingdom church, until Acts 15. When the, at the Jerusalem council, Christ um, notified the little flock through Paul that he had begun a new program using Paul as his apostle. God had interrupted and postponed the Kingdom on Earth program and had begun a new program in Acts 9 saving another group of people, the body of Christ, to live in the heavenly places. Paul knew that he was not fighting against flesh and blood but against the evil spiritual powers behind them, as mentioned in Ephesians 6.12. In, in his letter to the Thessalonians, he said, But Satan hindered us. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 As Paul dictates the letter to the Philippians, most likely written down by Timothy, he is, expects to be freed from prison. Through their prayers, and this is key, through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Mark that. That's in 119. The hearing had been he had been waiting for before Caesar was soon to take place. Paul wanted to magnify Christ. And um, by defending the gospel, Christ gave him to preach at the trial. Still, Paul had, pre had to prepare his dearly beloved friends that it was possible that Paul would be martyred. Nero was a Caesar at the time, and his mental instability was legendary and well recorded in secular history. He had uh, his mother and his wife killed. Nero would also blame the fires in Rome on the Christians, and large numbers of them were cruelly martyred and wickedly put to death. Still, have no fear, because if you get a hold of the grace message, not only will your soul be saved, but your life, like mine, will be changed forever. 
So let's get started with our chapter one. Maureen, would you please read verse one? Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Paul had been wrongly arrested, taken to Rome, placed on house arrest, and was now awaiting trial. Paul was facing possible martyrdom, but he managed to rejoice. There were divisions among some of the Christians in Rome, but Paul maintained a quiet confidence and courage. He wrote the letter to the Philippians that was uh, full of love and gratitude, concern, encouragement, and joy for them. In fact, the word joy or rejoice occurs 16 times in this letter. How was Apostle Paul able to have such joy and peace in the midst of and uncomfortable and difficult circumstances? He was single-minded. His concern was not for himself, but for Christ and the saints in the body of Christ and the furtherance of the gospel. Um, the, the, the Philippian church was mature and well-established, which can be deduced from Paul's address which includes bishops, that's the office of an overseer and elder, and deacons, spiritual servants in the church. Paul was on house arrest in Rome. Paul had probably visited them about A.D. 53, a year after the Jerusalem Council in A.D. 52, and was writing this letter in about A.D. 63, Paul was probably saved in AD 35, so he is writing 28 years later since his salvation, but 10 years after the founding of that church. Uh oh, I my pen. There we go. That's not a pen. Oh, well. I have one. I found one. Yay. <laughs> okay, so we have most joy. Okay. Um, uh, Paul writes, um, um, what did he say? In, in verse 1 he said, the servants of Jesus Christ. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so we have most joy when we serve Christ and each other in the body of Christ. Uh, verse 2, um, Nancy Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul can salute them from the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the spokesman to the body of Christ, just like Moses was God's spokesman to Israel. Furthermore, the Father is offering them and us grace and peace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, as it says in Romans 5.1 and Ephesians 2.8. Patty, verse 3, and 4. And no, all the way to 5. Patty, go all the way to 5. Okay. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So every time Paul remembered them in prayer with joy, he thanked God for them. Always, not just sometimes, making requests for them with joy. The church at Philippi was planted by Paul, like I said, on his second apostolic journey. God, through him, saved a handful of very different people who became the nucleus of that assembly. Back when they were in Troas, a vision appeared to Paul. In the night, there stood a man of Macedonia, praying him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Acts 16.9 when Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy arrived in Philippi, they discovered that the man of Macedonia was really a woman. Oh. And her name was Lydia. Oh. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. Now Thyatira is in Asia Minor. So she was from the Asia Minor, but she was living in Philippi. Which worshipped God, heard us. 
whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended to unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful in the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. That's Acts 16, 14 and 15. Paul baptized a few people during the Acts period, but none after the transition period was complete in Acts 28, 28. A damsel from whom Paul had cast out the spirit of divination was most likely part of the group, and that's mentioned in Acts 16, 16 through 18. When her masters realized that she could no longer foretell the future and gain them money, they had Paul and Silas arrested and beaten and cast into the inner prison with their feet in stocks, Acts 16, 19 through 24. How did Paul and Silas respond to their unfair treatment? At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them, Acts 16.25. The jailer was aroused by an earthquake and ran into the prison and saw that all the prison doors were open. He thought that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice. Oh, no, 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 no. He drew out his sword um, um, and was about to kill himself. But Paul stopped him. Mm -hmm. from killing himself. Paul mm -hmm. cried out with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Acts 16, 28. Mm -hmm. I just can't get over how Paul saved his jailer's life. Mm -hmm. That's so selfless and loving. Mm -hmm. The prisoners witnessed his joy in suffering and selflessness. The jailer took Paul and Silas to his home, and he and his family believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. This family was most likely part of the nucleus of believers at the church. Acts 16, 31, 32, 34. Yeah, go ahead, Patty, and close those doors. When Paul says, from the first day until now, notice how he just said that. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 5. That statement refutes the error that the body of Christ began in Acts 28. Now, instead of Acts 9. Because Paul connects what happened in Acts 16 with a letter that he wrote from Rome. Being Acts 28 is not great. The Acts 28 position says that the body of Christ began in Acts 28 and that the little flock was accepting converts until then. But the little flock stopped taking converts after the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, which is also Galatians 2. Paul was notified, notifying the Jews that God had begun a new dispensation through him from Acts 9.15 to Acts 28 when he uh, went to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. The nation of Israel um, fell and diminished during the Acts period, as it says in Romans 11, 11, 12. 11, 11 and verse 12. Paul did not have a separate ministry that began in Acts 28. The letter to the Philippians make it clear that the beginning of the church in Acts 16, continued on when he wrote to them from Rome. The dispensation of grace and the body of Christ began in Acts 9 when Christ appeared to Paul and he believed on Jesus while on the road to Damascus. This dispensation ends with Christ next, when Christ next appears in the air and the members dead and living are caught up to meet him in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. The mystery of the formation of the new creature, the one new man, is all in one part, not two. To cut straight where God divides, and he does not divide within, uh, we are to cut straight with where God divides, and he does not divide within the epistles of Paul. 
Dividing within the epistles of Paul is being hyper dispensational. Acts 13, 46, 8, 6, and 28, 28 are just three times in three different geographical areas, Asia Minor, Europe, and Rome, that Paul set the Jews aside to go to the Gentiles. Those Jews opposed themselves by not believing the gospel he preached so they could have everlasting life. Act 28 is the belief that Paul's authoritative teaching began after the conclusion of the book of Acts. This view is known as hyperdispensationalism or ultra dispensationalism. All of Paul's letters are authoritative, not just the ones after Acts 28. However, it is true that the Acts epistles are foundational information when Paul went to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. When Paul wrote the prison epistles, he had come to understand the mystery but was still receiving further and more advanced revelation for the body of Christ. J.B. Coles influenced E.W. Bullinger to go from believing that Paul's ministry began in Acts 13 to Acts 28. While J.B. Coles was the first to suggest this position, Charles H. Wells solidified it. Welsh is also Welsh also took some of Bullinger's projects, um, he took over some of uh, Bullinger's projects after he died. We should be careful to avoid brethren who hold to the Acts 28 error. Someone that says that Paul's ministry, the dispensation of grace, and the body of Christ began in Acts 9 with Paul's salvation, divides the Bible where God divides it, and is dispensational and correct. Other believers, like I said, are sub-dispensational or hypo-dispensational and hold the, the, the doc, to the doctrinal error that the body of Christ began when the Holy Ghost um, came down on the little flock in Jerusalem. Paul was the first person in the body of Christ, as it says in 1 Timothy 1.16. We do not divide within Paul's 13 letters. However, we do divide Paul's letters, the mystery, from the rest of the Bible, which is prophecy. But we study all of the Bible, as it says in Romans 15, 4, and 2 Timothy 3, 16. All um, of the Bible is profitable to us. Um, verse 6, Marie. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God had begun a good work in the church corporately and in each church member individually in Philippi. When they were saved, each when they were saved, each one received the Holy Spirit in them. God is working in them both individually and corporately to conform them to Christ and to have Christ live out his life through them. In Ephesians, we learn that we can do things because of the power of His might, Ephesians 6.10. This is the same Spirit which helps us to understand His Word that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 2, verses 11-13. through 13. We are dead, Colossians 3.3, 3, and we have Christ's life and power operating in us now. The day of Jesus Christ encompasses the three events, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, and Christ's presentation of the body of Christ to the Father. Paul wants to rejoice in that day when he, along with the rest of us in the body of Christ, are presented to the Father, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus Christ shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. 2 Corinthians 4.14 When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Colossians 3.4 That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, the glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5.26 and 27 
On that day, Paul will know that Christ's work through him was not in vain. Holding for, forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So Paul will know that all his work was valuable. Verse 7, Nancy. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Paul says that it is right, which means meat. Meat is, is right or fitting. That he has confidence in the fact that God has be, who began a good work in them will finish it until that day of Jesus Christ. Remember when we're presented to the Father? Because they are in Paul's heart, he prays for them and is grateful for their encouragement in his affliction. He says that they support his ministry both in his imprisonment and when he gives his defense and confirmation of the gospel before Caesar. The money they gave him may have helped him afford to hire a lawyer. Perhaps Zenus, the lawyer, helped Paul to get his case heard. Turn to Titus 3.13. Uh, Patty, can you read that? Bring Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. Okay, so there was a lawyer, Zenus, that was, um, you know, a grace believer. Okay, let's see, where am I? Okay, so they are partakers of his grace. Notice how he says that, um... At the very end of verse 7, ye all are partakers of my grace, mm -hmm. which means they are partakers of the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Look at 119. Look ahead to 119. Okay, this is very, very important. For I know that this shall turn out to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, we've been talking a lot in Ephesians about the power of his might in us. And um, I want you now to uh, turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Okay, so it's the spirit of Jesus Christ. Um, um, Patty, you want to read that? And Maureen, can you turn to Ephesians 3, 7, and 8? And he, okay, let me just say this. Okay. So it is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, verse 19, working in them, and the information Christ gave to them through Paul. So the sound doctrine, our, our spiritual edification uh, process that we went over that two-story house. So okay. Pat, Patty, go ahead and read 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay, so notice the power of Christ. Mm -hmm. So the sufficient grace is the power of Christ. We all have Christ in us. We all have the spirit of Jesus Christ in us. We all have his power. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's so important to get that. Um, Ephesians 3, 7, and 8, Maureen. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Okay, so because the Philippians know the sound doctrine that Paul was given, and understands the mystery, uh, they will be partakers of this grace. Because when Epaphroditus delivers the letter 
uh, to the Ephesian, uh, Philippians, to the Philippians, he will bring with him a copy of Ephesians, a copy of Colossians, and a copy of Philemon. Because the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. So all of the churches that Paul has started are busy, busy, busy copying all of Paul's letters. And they all have them all. And they're all reading them all. Because that's the word of God to the body of Christ. Okay? So they will not only get the Philippian letter, but they'll get those other three letters also. Okay? Um, because actually what happened was um, Tychicus and Onesimus had already left. Uh, that's why Timothy is being the secretary. Okay? Because Tychicus was the secretary. Tychicus and Philemon have already left to um, uh, Onesimus. Oh yeah, Onesimus and, and Tychicus have already left to take the letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians and Philemon. Okay? So that's why Timothy is, Philippians is actually the last letter that Paul wrote from the, uh, the prison epistle when um, he knew that the hearing was coming up. It was going to be happening very soon. Okay? So this is in AD 63 here. So uh, verse um, 8 and 9. Uh, Maureen? Well, why don't you do 8 and then Mar Nancy can do 9. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. So the bowels of Jesus Christ means God knows how greatly Paul longs for them with the depth of the love of Jesus Christ in his innermost being. Remember, he has the spirit of Christ in mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. So it resonates. He ha it's Christ's love for the Philippians mm -hmm. that is in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Go ahead, um, um, Nancy, 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Paul prays what he desires for them which is that their love may abound more and more among themselves in knowledge, in the knowledge of God and in all understanding and discernment um, of the doctrine Paul is sharing with the church. That's what he wants. He wants them to understand all the things that he's been writing. Patty, verse 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Okay, so this is part of the prayer. That they would approve things that are excellent, which is superior, not just good, better, or best. Approve means to be pleased with, to show to be true, commend to verify as true and right. What is, the, what is excellent in verse 3a? It is pursuing the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, and winning Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16, 25. Paul wants them to approve the doctrine Christ from heaven gave to him. Sincere means without wax. Some sculptors would fill in defects with wax, which would melt in the sun when the statue would, after the statue was purchased. So, not fake. Genuine is what sincere means. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, see? Paul wants the Philippians to live on a higher plane in their grace life now. Okay? And we should do. Paul wants the Philippians to be without offense, blameless, without flaws, inside and out, in their inner man, and in their conduct until the day of Christ. Paul wants. Paul gives a list of things which are excellent in verse um, in chapter four, verse eight. Whatever things are true, whatever things are so forth and so on. You know that one. Mm -hmm. oh, we okay. know that Christ's word to us through Paul in the King James Bible, rightly divided, is excellent. Amen. 
Um, Patty, verse 11, please. 11. Uh, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So if they allow Christ to live his life through them, by allowing the sound doctrine, Paul taught them um, to work in them by faith, then they will automatically produce fruit of righteousness by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. And remember in Galatians 5, 22, 23, we have all the fruits, mm -hmm. love, joy, mm -hmm. so forth and so on. It will be Christ in them doing the work, not them, unto the glory and praise of God. And so he gets all the credit. And uh, you remember in Romans 12, 1, it says that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice in Galatians 2.20, it says, um, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless yes, I live, yet yes, not I, I but, but the Christ, Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, um, let's look at Romans 12.1 and 2, one more time. Because... Um, we offer our bodies a living sacrifice for Christ to live in and through. Um, let me read that. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're going to be transformed by studying the Word of God, rightly divided, getting all of Paul's edification process into our inner man. So verse 12, um, it, whose turn is it, Maureen? But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Okay, so Paul starts a new paragraph. The Philippians were discouraged that their leader and apostle was in prison in Rome. Paul tells them that he wants them to know that the things that have happened to him, his imprisonment, have actually worked out to the furtherance of the gospel. The advancing of the gospel to um, places it would normally not have gone, such as Caesar's palace. Mm -hmm. The gospel is all the sound doctrine, Romans to Philemon, not just the salvation message given to Paul by Christ. If Paul had not been arrested and if the Philippians had not given him a gift, we may not have this letter to edify us in the body of Christ. So you see how that, you know, worked out for, for furtherance of the gospel? Having, being in prison, he had to write, right? Um, who's ready for verse 13? So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So he just said, you know, his bonds are manifest or revealed in all the palace and in all other places. The soldiers guarding Paul were chained to him for six hours at a time. Paul had a captive audience, and they heard the revelation of Christ, that Christ and the revelation that Christ had given him, and many trusted Christ and were saved and took the message to their other posts and in the palace, and in all other places. <laughs> <laughs> so what Satan wanted, you know, to shut Paul up, <laughs> and he wants to shut us up. Mm -hmm. He wants to silence us, mm -hmm. but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Now we ha he had a letter that has been read for 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years. With Christ, um, Paul was the source of a huge network of the gospel going forth and this was before phones or computers 
Uh, Patty, verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Many believers in the Lord grew much more bold and confident about sharing the grace message with others. They thought if Paul can tell others about Jesus being on arrest, we can certainly do it being free. Uh, verses 15 and 16, uh, Maureen. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, but not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Some were preaching Christ out of envy and strife, while others did it out of goodwill. Envy and strife are behind the attacks on other people's ministry. Some preached Christ while criticizing Paul. They wanted to magnify some controversy they may have concerning what Paul said. These were not sincere, supposing to add affliction to his bonds. Do you know of any preachers that love to criticize other preachers with controversies instead of focusing on what they themselves are doing for the Lord? We are to be responsible for our own ministry and mind our own business. Um, or uh, Nancy, 17. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. But others were preaching Christ out of love for Christ and his message through Paul. Jesus sent Paul. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14.37 So you can see that Paul knew that Christ was writing to the body of Christ through him. They were the commandments of the Lord. They were praying for Paul and helping him to get ready to make his defense before Caesar. That's the Philippians. The Lord Jesus Christ had told Paul that he would preach to kings. But the Lord said unto him, Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and, chil and the children of Israel. Acts 9.15 Paul had used his, this, his opportunity to speak before King Agrippa and Festus to present the gospel and save as many as possible in the audience. And his heart's desire was to do the same before Caesar and his audience. Paul wanted to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians 3.9. Um, Patty, verse 18. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul didn't care if people pretended to be sincere or preached the truth that Paul was Christ's apostle to the body of Christ. As long as Christ was preached, he rejoiced. He wanted people to be saved. Paul rejoiced that Christ was preached, just like John the Baptist rejoiced that the bridegroom, Christ, increased rather than him, the friend of the bridegroom, the best man. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy fulfilled, John 3.29. Paul will have more to say about those who preach Christ out of pretense later on in this letter. Um, whose turn is it? Maureen? Oh, uh, Patty, go ahead, 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Okay, underline the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Because Satan doesn't want you to know that you have the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you. Whenever we see the word salvation, see here where he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. What do we ask? What's he saved from? Yes, mm -hmm. salvation from what? 
Mm -hmm. In this case, it's Paul's deliverance from prison. Paul takes it for granted that they are praying for his release and that the Spirit of Jesus Christ will accomplish this. Although Christ is not using physical signs like parting the Red Sea to answer prayer today, our living God is working in and through the members of the body of Christ. He is interested in our inner man, our spiritual growth and development, individually and corporately. The mystery of godliness is that Christ is manifesting himself through the world, through the body of Christ believers. Okay, I'm going to um, now turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 3.16. And follow along with me as I explain this verse. 1 Timothy 3.16 Are you there? Okay. <laughs> and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. In Colossians 1.27 it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We just read in 119, the Spirit, what did we say? The Spirit of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. oh, supply uh, of see. the Spirit. Uh, supply Jesus of Christ. the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, okay? Mm -hmm. So that is what is meant with God was manifest in the flesh. Because the fact that um, Christ became flesh and dwelt among us in... Uh, um, John 1.14 that was prophecy that was prophesied you know the virgin was going to have, um, have a you know conceive and bear a child and it would be God with us right mm -hmm. Emmanuel so that fact that God would put on human flesh was prophesied mm -hmm. what was a mystery was the fact that Jesus Christ would be in the Body of Christ members. Okay? Mm -hmm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? Colossians 1.27. This is a great mystery, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? Mm -hmm. So, justified in the Spirit. That's Romans 3.26. Where it says that um, the Father could remain just because we have been justified and we have received the imputed righteousness of Christ so that when God the Father now sees us, he doesn't see us, he sees the imputed righteousness of Christ on us. So we have Christ in us and we have Christ on us, okay? Or we could also say we are in Christ, okay? So we are in Christ and Christ is in us. You see the two? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's justified in the Spirit, okay? Scene of angels, in Ephesians 3.10, it says that, you know, the, um, well, let's turn there. Ephesians 3.10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So the principalities there in uh, heavenly places, the principalities and powers in heavenly places, are good and bad angels that are observing us today because the yellow part, the mystery, was not in the Bible until Paul started writing his letters. And so they're all curious. All the angels are curious. The bad angels are curious because we're going to replace them. And the good angels are curious because we're going to be with them in the heavenly places. Okay? So, um, preach unto the Gentiles. See, um, Paul says in Romans eleven thirteen, For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. But now turn to Romans 15, 8. What does Romans 15, 8 say? Uh, Nancy, you want to read that when you find it? Romans 15, 8. And Maureen, can you turn to um, Matthew um, 15? Oh, let's see. 
Okay, uh, let's turn to Matthew 15. Let's see. No, oh, 10, 5, and 6. 10, 5, and... Uh, no, 10, um, 6, and 7. You're going to do 10, 6, and 7 in a little bit. Okay. Okay, first do uh, Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Okay, so who are the circumcision? The Jews, Jews. Right? right? Okay, so Jesus Christ was a minister to the Jews to confirm the promises made to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he never preached to the Gentiles. Gen a few Gentiles were saved during his ministry if they blessed Israel. Just like uh, God had said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Um, so let's see what it says now in uh, Matthew 10, 5, uh, 6 and 7. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh. <laughs> You know, that wasn't what I wanted. Uh, turn to Matthew 15. Okay. I wanted the uh, um, verse 24. Are you there, uh, Patty? Yeah. Go ahead, 1524. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, so... Um, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the house of Israel is the Jews, that's not the Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he preached to the Jews. So in this verse it says, preach on unto the Gentiles. So Paul was the one who preached unto the Gentiles, and he had... Yeah, you know, his ministry from the ascended risen Lord Jesus Christ. Remember we showed mm -hmm. you that? Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, he was actually preaching what Christ told him from heaven. Believed on in the world. Okay. So this message that Paul uh, was given is believed on in the world. Turn to Colossians one twenty three, Maureen. And um, Pat, uh, Nancy, you want to do Titus 2, 11, and 13. Skip 12. Hmm. Titus 2, 11, and 13. Go ahead. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Okay, so see, every creature under heaven heard the message that Paul gave. So, believed on in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, um, Nancy, Titus 2, 11 and 13. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God of, and our um, Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, so... See how it has appeared to all men in, in verse 11 there? I guess I could skip verse 13, which is our, uh, the blessed hope of our rapture. Mm. Received up into glory. Hey, I should put that verse back over here. So, you know, it was good that you read it. Um, because received up into glory is the rapture. You see that? Mm. You see how this, this um, the last thing mm. in this verse is received up to glory so that's the rapture of the church, hmm. okay? Because Christ ascended, which is true, but the order of the things that we've just covered in this verse, he ascended a long time ago, you know? He didn't preach to the Gentiles and then ascend, right? So, and, and that uh, rapture, those rapture verses are, of course, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Let's go there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Okay. So it says, um, 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, we get to be with him for eternity. So that's the uh, received up into glory. On the cross, the world witnessed the complete self-sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The spirit is still living. His spirit is still living. The life of Jesus Christ is lived out in his saints today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. Yeah. God is especially able to use mature adult sons and daughters who have come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4, by rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. These believers know what God is, that God is building the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace to live in heaven. God's will is that all men be saved and to come to understand the mystery. God is only speaking to us through his word. As we read, understand, and believe his word, we know what God is doing. We have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, and can think like he would think and behave like him in a selfless, loving, helpful, and kind manner. Um, whose turn is it? Patty, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always be, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul has an earnest expectation and hope that he will not be ashamed at the trial. His desire is that Christ uh, be magnified in his body, whether he lives or is put to death, as he boldly gives his defense before Caesar. Verse 21, Maureen. For to me, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For Paul to live is Christ, and to die is gain, because he will be with him. So Paul wins either way. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 5 through 10. Let's turn there. 2 Corinthians 5, 5 through 10. I'm going to inter interrupt this program <laughs> and just mention that um, I have a new book, Ephesians, a commentary. And... Um, See this? This is the heavenly places where we're going, okay? And on the back, it has the gospel. Um, and um, it has in here, it has the edification process that we went over. And let me just, you know, give you some of my other books. Uh, God's Secret um, is the one for, to help people understand the mystery. That's the basic book. Then we have a commentary on Romans, one on 1 Corinthians, one on 2 Corinthians, um, one on Galatians, <laughs> and then we have Romans through Gal Galatians commentary only in Treasure Hunt Volume 1. So um, we will be using also Laurie Verstegen's book through the Book of Books for our homework which we will be covering pages 213 through 219, and we will do that in lesson four of this um, four-part uh, going through Philippians one chapter at a time series. So um, if you do get some of my books, and I have a lot of summer specials going on right now on my Kindles for 99 cents. I think Romans and 1 Corinthians on the Kindle is available for 99 cents this week. And um, I'll have some more summer specials coming up. But if you get my books, please, please, please do a little review if you like the books. If you're going to give me five stars. If you're not going to give me five stars, don't do a review. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So here we are in 2 Corinthians 5, 5 through 10. And um, 
It says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. See, here it is again. We have the earnest of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So once, while we are in our physical body, we're absent from the Lord. Um, you know, n not that the, we, we have the Lord in us, but we are absent from being with him physically, you know, in our glorified body. Mm -hmm. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, will and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So, it will be good for those people who study the Word of God and understand it, rightly divide it. We will have something at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, um, where am I? What verse? Are, oh, okay, so Paul wins either way. Um, Maureen, uh, verse 22. But oh, if, no, you, you, you just did that one. Oh. Pat and N Nancy, I mean, 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. So the fruit of his labor is to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, if he will be pardoned from prison, the fruit of Paul's ministry is to magnify Christ in his body. But he doesn't know which one he wants to happen. So he doesn't know if he wants to live or die. Mm -hmm. Patty, verse 23. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. For he is in, middle, in the middle between two. He has a desire to depart this life and be with Christ, which is far better. Verse 24, Marie. Nevertheless, I abide in the no, flesh. No, to abide. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. But it's more valuable for them if he continues to live in his body. Yeah. Uh, verse 25, Nancy. In having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Paul is confident that he will stay in his physical body and continue with them for the furtherance of their joy of faith. See how it says there, furtherance, your furtherance and joy of faith. He believes that Christ will keep him on the earth to help the Philippians to enjoy his company once again so that they can have joy of faith. Uh, Patty, verse 26. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Your rejoicing or delight may be more abundant in Jesus Christ um, by Paul, uh, for, for Paul, when he comes to them again. Uh, Maureen 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Only let your manner of life, your behavior, your conduct be becoming to the gospel of Christ. As ambassadors, it is we need to be careful to present our Lord represent our Lord Jesus Christ in a way that honors him. We need to be bold to magnify Christ as we share the mystery. We stand in our position in Christ and are not moved away from the doctrine he gave us through Paul as we put into practice the grace life daily. Whether Paul is released or is absent because of being martyred, he wants to know that they are living excellent grace lives. Um, Paul desires that they are um, 
will conduct themselves in unity by standing fast in one spirit. See how it said there, there standing fast in one spirit with one mm -hmm. mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So um, he wants them to stand fast in one spirit. Striving um, um, together for the faith of the gospel. Striving means to earnestly make an effort. In this case, doing all they can to save souls and share the mystery. Because Paul was, has related the sound doctrine that Christ has given them, they can all say the same thing and have the same mind, which is Christ. They all know the same truth and have the same one spirit in them, Colossians 1.27, so that, um, and also 1.19. So with all that singleness of mind, see, we, had, we said that Paul had a single mind. Mm -hmm. Now he wants the Philippians to have a single mind so they can work as a group for the faith of the gospel. Um, whose turn is it to read? Me. Okay, go ahead, Nancy. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Okay. So, and in nothing terrified of your adversaries. So he doesn't want them to be afraid of their adversaries. Okay. Who's behind the adversaries? Satan. That's correct. Which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you of salvation and that of God. The salvation here is from the terrifying tactics of the enemy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Epaphroditus had informed Paul of those who persecuted the church and who opposed his apostleship. Perdition means ruin, destruction, the utter loss of soul, and final happiness in a future state. So it's the loss of that. If the Philippians courageously magnify Christ and his mystery, it will be a token of perdition to their adversaries that their strategy didn't work. Satan has an active policy of evil against the grace doctrine in this dispensation. He wants to silence them from holding forth the word of truth. I mean, holding forth the word of life. Okay? We'll see that in 2.16. So when we, we get to 2.16, it talks about holding forth the word of life. Paul describes their adversaries in 3.2, and we'll cover that when we get to chapter 3, saying their end is destruction, 3.19. Oh, well, let's just look at it now. Okay, uh, Patty, can you read 3.2? Maureen, can you read 3.19? You bet. 3.2. Philippians. Oh, okay. Uh, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Okay. So those are, are the adversaries. Okay, mm -hmm. he warns them against those. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Maureen. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay, so when we get there, we'll cover it. But just the basics is that their God is their bellies. They want to... They want to have another jet plane, okay? Mm -hmm. They're the pastors that want to have lots of money. They want their, their people to tithe mm -hmm. so that they can have bigger bellies, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in today's health and wealth gospel, for example, or even the denominational um, gospels that are being um, put out there by many pastors who don't rightly divide, they're, you know, sold out to wanting to ha have nice homes mm -hmm. instead of preaching the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have to decide sometimes between the two. Are we going to um, teach and preach the truth or not? Um, saying that the, their end is destruction. So uh, Paul knew that his adversaries preached Christ to their own destruction because they were not following the one apostle Christ has a, had appointed to the body of Christ. So now I'm going to read a few verses that talk about following Paul. So we know that many uh, pastors and teachers are not following Paul. 
and that's their error. Um, so wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. 1 Corinthians 4.16 Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.11 I mean 11.1 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Ephesians 5.1 To follow God is to follow Paul, okay? who he sent. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. Philippians 3.17 So when we get to Philippians 3.17, we find out that we should be listening to the grace preachers and teachers. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. 1 Thessalonians 1 6. So they became followers of us. The us there in this last verse is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who were all following Christ to follow Paul. Satan uses unsaved people to promote his lie program, but he can also use ignorant, saved people to preach a false gospel. If his adversaries are saved, they will be raptured, but their work will be destroyed, burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says he will suffer for the sake of Christ because of evil and ignorant brethren. So he was willing, right, to suffer. Mm -hmm. he, he says, um, he said that. Um, some who are unknowing influenced by Satan, you know, those principalities and powers and in the um, high places. Mm -hmm. um, but we are to carry on as good soldiers, as it says in 2 Timothy 2 3. But the Philippians will have something of value at the judgment seat of Christ. What will they have? They'll have gold, silver, and precious stones. Um, and uh, that will be of God. No one will have anything of value if they have not built on Paul's foundation. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Okay. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, the me there is Paul, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So that's Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, which is the foundation of Jesus Christ with Paul's foundation on top, Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, which means revealed, for the day shall declare it, that's the judgment seat of Christ, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay? So those people who wrongly divide, but have actually trusted the true gospel that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again, will be saved, but they won't have anything uh, of value at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, verse 29, um, Nancy? Philippians? Oh, no, it's, it's Patty. Go ahead, oh, Patty. Okay. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his Which is Paul, suffered, chances are that we will too. This is not the health and wealth gospel that many are falsely preaching today. Um, 30, uh, Maureen, last verse. 
having the same conflict which we ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. So they will have the same conflict as Paul had, the desire to depart and be with Christ, or to stay and edify others. Sometimes tired Godhead. Join me in a word of prayer as we end this, this Bible study for today. Thank you, Holy Father God, for your word, which is so rich and wonderful to us. And for all those who have joined us in this little Bible study and um, are supporting it by getting the books and giving us reviews and sharing this um, little Bible study with others. We're so grateful, Lord, for all that you do. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, wait, wait, not yet. Don't turn it off yet. I just want to say something about the book because um, I, you know, a lot of people wonder, well, why should I get the book when Marianne is posting the chapters for free? Okay, let me say that I only posted the rough draft and I didn't include, um, you know, all of the great things that God has given me in Ephesians 1 through 6 because he gave me more. Mm -hmm. And also in this book here, um, it, um, it is such a great book and it has so many different pictures. And not only that, I also included some wonderful articles like the one on um, who is the bride of Christ. It's in here. And also reasons why um, the body of Christ did not begin in Acts 2 is in here and there are um, there's an article in, in there's of course it's the chapters that um, were um, uh, six chapters in Ephesians but there's also an article by Pastor Jordan about what does uh, no condemnation mean mm -hmm. and there's a, a, some, a great article by Pastor Sam Gearhart that talks a little bit briefly about church history and um, there's um, and several great articles by Sister Leanne Miko um, mm -hmm. that uh, for example you know should I only be reading the red letters mm -hmm. you know in the Bible or you know could all the Bible be in red letters because it was all given by God and so um, here is some um, pictures here of uh, some of the um, people that were, you know, also finding out because they realized that we were not Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, they were starting to a uh, resurgence of uh, the Pauline point of view in the Bible. But actually, you know, Paul was the one who gave us in you know the information but it was a resurgence of understanding by these men and so it's all in here this is a wonderful book and I, I hope you all get it thank you for joining us bye for now see you next week <laughs>